So we must begin by knowing our campus climate and representation of diversity. So UIC goals are to really create this climate of diversity, equity, um, and inclusion with individual students, faculty, and staff, where they feel welcomed with their identities, valued for their contributions, and feel their identities can be openly expressed wherever they live, work, and study. So this, again, is a, huge, a major goal for UIC and transformation of the college. So we have a pretty diverse student body with unique backgrounds, as 54% of the freshmen state that diversity is important in their decision to attend UIC, 52% of undergraduates and majority of graduate students are women, 38% of them are first generation college students, 72% of freshmen expect opportunities to interact with students from different backgrounds, and almost 9% of students are non-traditional, so 25 and up. So many of the students that are at UIC really are expecting diversity to be instilled as a value throughout their education. So undergraduates by race in 2020. At this level, students are predominantly Latinx or Hispanic, um, almost 20% Asian and only 6% Black. At the graduate level, the demographics shift a bit to predominantly white and international students, only 10% being Hispanic or Latinx and 6% being Black. So our faculty racially, um, majority are 40% white, which has been a trend since 2013. 16% are Black and 14 are identify as Hispanic or Latinx. Consistently, consistently UIC faculty are majority female as about 60% of them, again, kind of as a trend um, have been female. Also, if they identify as an underrepresented minor minority, they're mostly female around 70%. So, so what, why should you care about this? Well, we need to uphold the mission of the school as one of the nation's most diverse public universities, uh, minority serving institution, which again means we should be more attentive to the needs of, student of students of color and diversity. These race and gender stats of faculty are even more stark in nursing as we are predominantly white and female college. The biggest thing that I hear as a faculty of color is that we need strategies to support students of color. And it really starts with this awareness of disparities, but also examining um, diversity or lack of diversity in nursing. So nationally, it is known there's a critical lack of diversity in academic nursing. Um, there's a need to increase diversity, inclusion, and equity, which is recognized by the American Association uh, Colleges of Nursing, as well as the nursing, National Institutes of Nursing Research. These really stress the failure to retract, attract and retain people of color. Therefore, we need to create environments that support their scholarly growth and retentions of students of color through mentorship. Mentorship throughout all the literature I've, I've read is critical in engaging students of color, as well as recognizing the whiteness in nursing and know that we may not be able to achieve representation or racial concordance of our students um, is really critical in our, our awareness to mentoring them. So we're going to speak to five strat strategies to successfully mentor students of color. This presentation focuses on centering the voices and experiences of Black women. So the first one we'll be talking about is how to create a team. Um, also being aware of student experiences, respect, honor, and celebrate diverse student backgrounds, considering the impact of trauma within students and their backgrounds and experiences, as well as how to develop mentoring competence. So, one of the first things that I've done when I came here, and I'm in my second year with the rollback at UIC as a faculty, is really aimed at increasing my visibility 
Um, so some of those strategies I've used were giving guest lectures, attending college and community events and presenting at those events, sharing my contact information and inviting students to reach out to me has been a really good strategy I've used, as well as talking to colleagues about wanting students of color on your team. Um, I have a great mentor team as well as colleagues who we really strive to have diversity as a part of our teams. And so I've had students be referred to me or I've been referred to students who might be interested in working on, on my research project. And my research focuses on um, protecting black female sexuality and um, the prevention of STIs and HIV. I think another huge step that that I've personally used is really try to assess student strengths, um, ask them about their interests and how they align with with my research. I also have many students work with me as they identify as black women and my mission and goal of my research, they connect to that. So I think it's really important to ask students what they're interested in, how they want to be involved in research, and then really assess their strengths and speak to those strengths as a part of your research team. Um, I also asked students, many, not many of them are familiar with qualitative research methods or writing. And so it's kind of like, oh, well, let's do this. Let's try it and do it together and do it within a, in a group um, with creation of um, a welcoming space and honoring mistakes. Also, that team really helps to create a support system and a collaborative environment. Um, we really lean on each other to assist in collaboration. So there's a lot of peer mentoring within that team that we've, we've been able to create. Um, if someone's not really understanding it, I'll you know, ask Alyssa or ask Diamond to try to explain uh, in a different way what exactly, how do we, how do we analyze data quali qualitatively? How do we code? Because um, sometimes I'm not, I'm not saying it clearly and you need more perspectives. So another huge part of great mentoring is this awareness of the student experience. Um, a very common and critical issue for students of color, the ones that I've worked with, have been microaggressions. Um, many of us know what this definition is, but for those who do not, it's a statement, action, or incident regarded as an instance of of indirect, subtle, or unintentional discrimination against members of a marginal, marginalized group. Um, I know some of you had, or Diamond, or Aurora, or Alyssa had an example of a microaggression that you've experienced. Do you wanna, one of you wanna share? I'll go ahead and share mine. Um, I get this often, especially when I change my hairstyle, it's, oh, I didn't know who you were. Um, or I didn't notice you today, you look a lot different, um, which is very, very subtle, but it happens so often it builds up. Thank you for sharing that. And another important thing that we need to be aware of are micro invalidations. And so this is, I guess, less common, people might not know what this is. Um, they're communications that exclude, negate, or nullify the psychological thoughts, feelings, or experiential reality of a person of color. Um, Wara, do you want to share your example? Yeah, so some of the experiences that I've had around micro-invalidation uh, surface around my name. So people, like being in academic spaces, especially in higher academia, um, people intentionally not wanting to say my name or using other reconstructions of my name um, add to like this exclusion from the group or just negating just my identity as a person. So that has happened pretty frequently. And thank you for sharing that. That's really common. I think as faculty, I've I've done that before. You know, I'm I'm absolutely have try to avoid saying someone's name right because I don't know it when in reality we should just ask it's simple how do you pronounce your name um Alyssa do you have any examples you want to share 
Uh, yeah, no. So mine is more uh, towards micro invalidation. So um, I remember uh, one organization I joined, um, there was another girl, girl who joined at the same time and she was white and pretty much our educational or academic background um, were at the same point. Um, and so um, coming in, um, the head of the program, you know, took the time to meet individually with um, either student. Um, however, as the year went on, I was approached by um, someone in our group and they had asked me, they're like, hey, um, has the director ever, you know, talked to you about, you know, potentially having your own independent project or, you know, being a first author paper on anything? And I was like, no, I've only met with this person um, one time out of the time I've ever seen them other than, you know, passing. Um, and during this time, I was actually applying to uh, get into med school um, for an MD-PhD program. Um, so after I had gotten accepted in, all of a sudden, you know, she was sending me emails. She was all over me. She was like, hey, Alyssa, come to my office. You know, um, I want to see if I can get you a first author paper, all this different stuff. And so um, it was a little bit weird as to why she was putting in more work in another student who had pretty much the same background and was doing the same work um, in comparison to me. And it wasn't until I had proved myself worthy to her um, to the point that her boss was actually coming down to come visit me and say hi to me that she thought, oh wait, maybe I should be paying a little bit more attention to Alyssa. Maybe I should be giving her more opportunities than um, I had been doing in the past. Thank you for sharing that, Alyssa. And I think I have witnessed this too um, at UIC, but also at other predominantly white institutions is the assumptions that we make, right? Based on what students look like um, and attributing accolades or opportunities to other students because of the way that we look. So you're, or you're, you're speaking to also implicit bias, right? Um, and that I think we, subconsciously do these make these decisions, but they really affect our students and they see that and they feel that. Um, also, we really need to be aware that these microaggressions, micro invalidations happen to students in and outside of our research teams, right? So part of, I think, creating this team is also recognize, recognizing sometimes they might need a space to talk about what's happened to them at the college level in life, right? Um, and also being intentional that we do not perpetuate or micro invalidate within our own spaces. Um, I think one of the biggest things is that being upfront that you may make mistakes, but also you're open to being called out and having a discussion, right? I think that's one of the best things that you can do um, as well as asking how you can support them. I think it's really important we don't depend on students to have the answer or to willingly share this information. So it's really critical to ask students how they're doing. How are you feeling as a first year, first generation student? How has your experience been as a part of the research team? I think it's really important to offer, to state, like one of the first things I say is I'm really flexible. Please come talk to me if something's not working or this is too much at any time because life happens. Um, so those are, I think, the three biggest things is being up front. And then in nursing, we have a culture of not being able to, to make mistakes. And that's part of the profession, but, all, but that's not true. We all do. Um, and I think creating a space and saying, I'm, I want to know if I'm, if I'm causing you any harm is, is really, again, critical. So another strategy is really to respect, honor, and celebrate diverse student backgrounds. So we wanted to speak to creating a welcoming space. Um, many may have heard this be referred to as safe space, but I think it's more, especially as white females, right, as the College of Nursing is re mostly represented as, to really create a welcoming space, because at some point, you might be creating a, a space that isn't safe for students of color. So really try to um, identify team needs. That's one of the critical, critical things that we do, um, which may include community building or this space being an outlet to vent about experiences. So going back to kind of what I spoke about being flexible, we have an hour a week, you know, we come and we meet together and I have certain tasks I know I need to delegate or projects we need to discuss. But that first 30 minutes is really a space to check in and to see how we're doing and to see what's going on. And that really helps create this, this welcoming space. Um, 
I think a lot of us also don't discuss culture within our research, um, whether that's you're studying nurses and you're, you're discussing the culture of nursing. Or with me, I do research with Black girls and women. Culture is so central to the work that I do, and it's something that needs to be discussed. And I think there's a lot of, you know, discomfort when you're a white-bodied person who is doing research with populations of color. But what it does, it, it doesn't create a welcoming space if you don't address it, right? If you don't say, also with part of that, Share your personal story as to why you're doing research with this population. What led you to, to pursue this background? Many of us are very passionate about the work that we do. Students see that. Um, also asking students about their culture, right, is really important. Um, with my research team, we're, you know, identifies Black females, connect very deeply with, with the research. That we're doing, whether we're interviewing girls or um, writing up, right, this qualitative, qualitative research, there's really deep connections with the work that we're doing. Also, students can relate to the research more and see themselves in the, in the research that they're doing. Um, being flexible, again, huge, right? Some research meetings may be more focused than others. You might be able to run through all 17 of your tasks, or sometimes you might need to get to the, your, your number one, your priority, because why? We all are living our lives and things are happening to us and changing. And it's really important to, again, talk about those things, especially within the context of, of COVID and uh, racial injustice that's happening. Also, we talked a lot about demonstrating equitable power. I think as faculty, we see ourselves as experts, right? But we are not always the experts of our, our research populations, of student experiences, of mentoring. And I think it's really important to think about how you're progressing the team, right? So I talked earlier with, with my team about this and they're like, you gotta, you know, not only talk the talk, but you have to walk the walk. So actions are really important here. Um, and like Alyssa's example, be equal in opportunities that you give students, um, connect them to other mentors and recognize differences. So again, it might be an elephant in the room that you're a white, white woman and you're working with the all black research team when it shouldn't address it head on, acknowledge that you're you're white and you have a different lens and you have privilege. Um, also have empathy for students and what they're going through. I think another strategy which they'll speak to in the panel is really taking accountability for transgressions, right? Taking accountability for that you are part of a system that is oppressive, um, taking responsibility for the privilege, right? Or the oppressive forces that are really harming, harming students. Um, acknowledging, again, social justice privilege associated with um, research, right? We're at a privilege. We have power in doing research with populations. And to recognize that and then to say what we're doing to fight against these systems. I think being vocal, again, not relying on the student to ask you these questions, but being upfront, it helps to create this welcoming space. Also engaging their diverse perspectives in research. So this semester we've done tons of writing and they are all new at it. They're not qualitative experts um, by any means, but they're learning skills. And so I think a lot of this is being patient um, and supportive. And so maybe that's meeting another hour outside of the research team to talk about how to code um, or how to create a code book. Um, also with our identities aligning so close to the research that we're doing, it's important to, to engage in reflexivity and to memo. So we're also doing some work um, with black fathers and writing about those experiences as, as part of, of research and how that makes us feel. You know, one whole meeting we talked about the role of black men in our lives, right? And how they've shaped or not been present in, in shaping our um, social and sexual identities. So this is a big one, um, considering impact of trauma on students, which I think we, again, don't discuss and we kind of gloss over. 
Um, many students, again, come from diverse backgrounds and have various forms of trauma. This could be familial trauma, microaggressions, micro invalidations, um, immigration, right? For being first generation students, um, also generations of historical trauma um, and research topics, again, can stir up emotions as they might trigger or be personal. Um, my research also hits on sexual trauma. So I think that's a big thing that, you know, we're up front with, hey, this is hard, stigma, race, colorism, right? These are all things that are all over my data. Um, and to talk about coping strategies, how do you deal with that? Part of it's talking, part of it's creating a team where we can talk through it um, and we can vent and we can be frustrated at what participants say, or we can be frustrated with the system. Um, also, again, with the context of COVID and social injustice with Asian hate, Black Lives Matter movement. Allyship is critical, um, but it's really important to promote allyship that isn't performative. And so we talked about what this meant. Um, do any of you wanna share? We have a lot of ideas, but I think the biggest part piece of this is it's consistent, right, across all spaces, whether that's social media, in person, in research teams, in, in your personal life with your families, that is, is critical. Do you, any of you want to share about the allyship piece or should we wait? I need to wait. Okay. Yeah. I think another big piece of what we talked about was listening is critical with allyship. Um, don't speak for the population, don't play devil's advocate. Um, also, don't use phases like I completely understand or I went through X to com offer comparisons. That's kind of a lot, I think, of what, what we've, we've seen or dealt with. Um, but really it goes, boils down to also having empathy, authenticity and consistency. So developing mentoring comp competence. We've developed a really consistent schedule and rapport. So we meet every week at the same time, but also, like I said, the beginning, the first thing we do is check in. And it's often beyond a how are you, right? It's how are you really doing? Or sometimes it's met with huffs and puffs or I'm tired or, and it's asking on a deeper level, well, you know, oh, well, what happened, right? So it's, it's beyond the simple, how are you? I think how are you is, is very important, a, a important starting I think point. They, her opening was, what she says is um, the 11. Okay. And, uh, I and you can find out what uh, time she, well, she said nine to seven. And so we want to go to wherever her opening. Can someone mute themselves? Uh, I'm not sure who uh, it is. Uh, a little bit. Okay. Um, so the how are you is a good starting point. But with developing rapport, it's going beyond the how are you and really reading body language, right? Reading, listening to the huff and puff, lifts, all of that is really critical. Um, be clear when you're describing the purpose, roles, and expectations of students and their roles on certain projects. That also boils down to authorship, you know, why certain students are going to be listed for first or second. Um, and really being open to explaining your rationale behind those decisions. Um, engage mentees by asking for their ideas about research directions. So I think one of my favorite things is, is picking their brains, asking them, what do you think about this? What if we ask this question? How should we ask this question to Black men, to Black girls? Um, which is, again, one of my favorite things. So that's where I get more ideas. Also, the more that we talk and we share, there, there's more ideas that come out of that, right? Um, also support in a sensitive way. So this is really important regarding obviously the other slides I just presented about context, about culture, um, being sensitive, right? I think that really includes effective communication, instilling confidence and transparency. And so an example of transparency in our research that happens often is being transparent about our capacities for that week. 
um, for what work we can get done, as well as being compassionate and understanding if a task doesn't get done within our timelines. And I think, again, it's as faculty and tenure track or and faculty in general, we have timelines, but sometimes students can't stay on our timeline. And it goes back to being flexible, but also having empathy um, and this effective communication style. We don't want our students to be scared to tell us, hey, Dr. Crooks, I can't get this done. I'd rather you say that than three weeks you know, down the line, it's not done. So I think it's, again, it's, it's a helpful skill, the transparency about capacity and what we can take on each week because that's gonna vary. And there's some weeks where I come in and I'm like, I haven't read anything <laughs> or I haven't, I haven't done my task for our research meeting. And so also part of that is the, the transparency and honesty from me as this leader, right? Um, and instilling confidence really, I, I try hard to support them in any way that I can, whether that's applying for med school or um, looking over, helping them write or helping them code their data. Um, part of our check-ins is they all are at different phases in their student careers. Um, and so those uh, check-ins really are good to assess again where they're at, where they're at um, and to celebrate as Alyssa just passed one of her med school exams. I think it really, we've created a space that we support one another and um, instill confidence, because that's great. We have to, we must celebrate one another. Um, also creating SMART goals. So this oh, is one really, of my- Really great, Natasha. Um, so like to add on okay. to that, with the support, um, also to, also I think uplifting is super important. And Natasha, you kind of touched on, you know, uh, me, Warren, and Diamond are at like three different stages, you know, within our academic career. And so um, with that, we have three different confidence levels. And so not necessarily, let's say in this group, um, I'll give this a specific example, but another research group that I'm in, um, we oftentimes will go around and, you know, each person will give a presentation on uh, whatever research that they're doing that might be relevant to the topic at hand or might not be relevant. And so um, one thing that I know that I learned within this group uh, with support is that, you know, getting those compliments of like, hey, you did a really good job of like writing that piece or, you know, oh, that's a really wonderful idea. Uh, in this group, after every time everybody presents, I know I personally even if I have questions, the first thing I'll start off with is, you know, hey, you did a great job on your presentation. I really loved your energy, the way you spoke about this or this, um, and just kind of saying more comforting, uplifting words to kind of let them know that, hey, you know, public speaking is something that's super scary and super daunting to do, but the fact that you did it and you did it well in your own way is something that needs to be acknowledged. And so I remember um, the very last group that I was, uh, or the very last meeting that we had after I said that, um, one of the girls in the group was like, hey, Alyssa, thank you so much. Like, I really appreciate that because, you know, I was really nervous. I thought that I wasn't good enough. I thought that I was going to, I did a crap job, you know, at this presentation and you continuously giving uplifting words um, allows me to build my confidence. So I think that's another thing that's um, important to do, especially as junior scientists. Um, a lot of the times we don't think that we're good enough to do something. So it really helps to hear from um, our uh, mentors and then also our peers at the same time that like, no, we're actually doing well in our own way. Absolutely. And Alyssa, you're speaking to like imposter syndrome, right? And so feeling like you're in these academic scientific spaces and you have to talk a certain way, right? Or you have to act a certain way or you have to know what coding means when you don't, right? And so I think part of that is, is again, instilling the confidence to even be able to ask the question in that space. What is coding? What is to be able to speak freely um, in, in that space is, is Import, very important, but it goes back to the confidence piece. Um, so yeah, I think that we, our team, we, we really are a great support of one another. Um, so back to the SMART goals. So those of you probably know what SMART goals are, um, but they're specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-based. So I just said, sometimes the timeline has to go out of the wind, you know, out the window. Um, but we really try to set deadlines um, and really specific. So for example, in our research meeting, I'm like, okay, can you write this section? You know, Diamond, we're gonna write this section of the results. Can you have it done in two weeks? Um, and I ask, do you feel like that's realistic? And sometimes 
it's yes. Most of the time it's yes, but sometimes it's no. Like I can't get through transcript number three in a week. <laughs> That's okay, right? So I think SMART goals are a great foundation, right? But then also paying attention to context, right? Of, of what they're telling you, but assessing is this, it might be a SMART goal for, for us, but the team needs, right? Like what is most critical? What is What do we need to get done next week? Um, and with that, since we've started all together in August, we're like a little baby team. We just started together. Um, we have two publications under review. We're doing this presentation. We're currently writing two more. Um, and I'm really excited about what we've been able to do, right? It goes back to this growing and glowing of our, of our team. Um, and I think another important thing that I try to do and that my mentor is role model for me is advocating, right? And that's advocating in, in, in every space. Um, and advocating for them is sometimes writing letters of recommendation. It's helping them with applications, rereading applications, serving on their dissertation committees, or sometimes it's just talking to them at night when they need someone to hear them and to listen. So those are kind of the bigger um, five strategies that we uh, really try to implement in our research team. And now I'm going to transition to the student panel discussion. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'll ask these questions, but here's kind of what um, a roadmap of what we'll be discussing. As student experiences are critical and central. Here we go. All right. So I'll give a, should I introduce you all? Let me do a brief introduction of my amazing team. So we'll start with Diamond Coleman. Do you want to say hi? Hi, everyone. How are you? I'll let you introduce yourself. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. um, I am new to Natasha's team, as she mentioned. I was first on another USC research team, Amara. Um, and I transferred to the team given that one of our mentors actually did exactly what she illustrated with referring me to another mentor who can give me um, a different perspective and insight that was most closely related to my motivation to dismantle health disparities. Um, I definitely have a more general goal in mind, but since then I've been working more on sexual health disparities. So. I'm also pre-med and that's the goal, the more um, nearer goal. I can go next. Okay. Um, so I'm Laura Olaf Sosina. I am a fourth year doctoral student at Abbott University uh, here in Chicago. And I got connected with Dr. Crooks through my mentor. So when she's talking about mentors who connect you to other mentors, uh, my mentor from Adler connected me to her because of my interest uh, as it relates to like the sexual health disparities of black women. Um, and I think that was like sometime, like almost a year ago. So since then we've been connected and participating on her research team as well. So that is my piece. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alyssa Deborah, and I am a second year student um, at uh, UIC College of Medicine. I'm also in the MD, PhD, or MSTP program. Um, and how I essentially met Natasha is uh, my research interest for my PhD deals with infectious disease, global health, um, and um, the pediatric population. And so um, most of my background comes from basic science research, uh, bench lab research. And so switching over to public health, which would be a little bit more qualitative, um, the mentor that I initially met, um, she had a project that was a little bit similar to what I wanted to do, but sim similar to Diamond, where I didn't have a lot of experience and I needed more exposure within public health, within qualitative um, sciences, she introduced me to Natasha. And so um, I've, it's, it's been a blessing to be able to work with Natasha and, you know, uh, learn so many new things and um, just new perspectives on what public health is and what research is within the qualitative sense. Perfect. Well, you all answered the first question beautifully. So we'll move on to the second one. Um, how has your experience been in research on various research teams? And this can be positive or negative experiences or both? 
I guess for me overall, not necessarily like speaking to a specific team, but overall, I feel like with research, I, I've been fighting for my life <laughs> where it's like, I haven't had a lot of guidance because uh, my both my parents are immigrants. And so coming to this country, um, going to college, it was it was literally a minefield where I didn't know where to turn left or right. Um, the advisor that I was given during the time was not the best advisor. And um, at the institution I went to, although they said that they emphasized um, assisting you know, uh, minority students in terms of getting into research, I didn't really feel a lot of that support. So um, the way that I guess I got into research was essentially a lot of cold calling and cold emailing. So I would just you know, look up random professors based off the research that I believe to be interested in, and I just kind of reached out. Um, and so thankfully, I feel like every research group that I've been in um, I don't know if this is, you know, pure dumb luck or, you know, based off the, you know, picking and choosing of the mentors. Um, I've had pretty good experiences where um, both the mentor, um, both the, the type of mentorship that my mentor had and who I was aligned up together really well, where I was able to kind of learn more about myself and learn more about um, what research was in general. Um, there have been kind of like highs and lows and hiccups in terms of, um, I felt like with some research groups, um, I didn't have the best guidance, but I think within the group that I was in, I never, I always felt supported and I always felt like this was a safe space for me to kind of learn more about research and develop my skills and you know contribute to the group. Oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> um, like Alyssa, I started with wet lab research. And so that was a totally different experience from what I'm doing now. Uh, I definitely experienced more micro invalidation in that setting and not necessarily from my mentor per se, but just from the team that I was with. It was totally the opposite from um, our team now. And so I was actually the only black person on the team, not just black female. And I would, I was honestly the most experienced in the lab had been doing it the longest, but I was the one that was always questioned more or, um, my, just my information wasn't enough for them. And so I was never accepted as a real mentor in the team. And I think it was mostly due to my identity and um, racially and gender identity. And so I kind of made this pivot when I went into more health disparity research. And so since then I've been seeking more um, mentorship and guidance with racial concordance. And so I think that has helped tremendously. Um, and I don't think that's the only thing, but I think because it's so aligned to um, our work and our lived experiences, I haven't had a um, anything that is as negative as my wet lab experience. And so since then, I would say I've noticed a big change. Um, I would add that, so during undergrad, my experiences was like somewhat negative, similar to what Diamond was saying, being the only black woman on a research team. So I often like felt excluded. I wasn't included in like team meetings or like different projects. And it wasn't until grad school. Um, and actually my mentor, who was actively seeking out black students to participate in the research team, where I felt included, um, just because it was a lot of similar faces. She took a very, um, a learning approach to getting to understand us and our identities, but then also a teaching uh, approach as well, where she taught us things that we didn't learn to be able to speak to the um, demands of this type of level of research. So it wasn't until undergrad where I had a Black mentor in that space who was actively looking for people of color to participate in the research team that it became a more corrective experience as well. And you're hitting on a good point that I want to dig deeper on is actively seeking right out students of color. What does that look like? What it what could you explain that to us? What does it look like? How does that make you feel when someone or a mentor or research team is saying we're actively seeking students of color? Yeah, so uh, this mentor and professor, she did so like in the classroom. So like in during our class lecture, she would uh, like do little impromptu, like this is my research that I'm doing. 
she would also meet us in our like organization. So we had a we have an Adler Black Student Association. So she would always come in there and um, promote her research team, also flyers, talking to us in the cafeteria area. So it was like actively searching for us in our spaces that helped to like invite us into her research team. Um, and she always had an open door policy as well. So we can always come in and ask questions, which made us feel not so hesitant or reserved, like, am I competent enough to participate on this team? So those were some great things that helped. Have either Diamond or Alyssa, you've experienced that, this kind of actively seeking out students of color? I'd say I had to be the person to actively seek out, um, especially, I'm even thinking back to my mentor for grad school. Um, she was Asian American and I had, I was doing work research on um, black males with prostate cancer. And so even then I was like, okay, can I find someone else who's doing this research who is black? And I had to go and find that person. Um, I haven't had the opposite like Laura. Yeah, similar to uh, Diamond, um, for me, any research group that I've entered, I've had to be the one to kind of seek that out. Um, but uh, most of my mentors, so like Natasha is my first black mentor I've ever had within um, research, but most of my mentors have been um, actually um, Indian um, or one uh, actually identified or had Indian ancestry, but identified as like South African. Um, but more so, I don't know if I guess because they were a minority as well, they were able to um, kind of learn how to create a space and understand that because I also am a minority, I'm going to have, let's say, different needs per se. Um, but I will say once I did enter their labs, it was more of a supportive group, but it would be really nice to be able to know which spaces or which research groups are seeking um, different researchers who come from diverse backgrounds versus me having the onus on myself to have to seek them out and, you know, giving them an interview to figure out, okay, are you someone who I can trust? Are you someone who's going to um, allow me to grow and develop in the way that I need to? Or am I going to, is, is this kind of like a bad group for me to be in overall? Thank you for that. It's giving me some ideas. Like maybe we need to create a forum, of a board or something. Hey, look, seeking, you know, students of color for research. Um, in terms of mentorship experience, what would you say has worked and what would you say has not worked? And this could be with any mentors or specifically with white mentors, right? Because we're also speaking to a predominantly white, white space within College of Nursing, but science in general? I will say like what didn't work, kind of going back to like the performative allyship, that's why I said we can wait till later. Um, that was one of the biggest things that was disruptive in my experience in undergrad. So the lack of consistency in the allyship, so there was like advocacy in some places, but advocacy in the places that I needed to like elevate as a student of color, that's where they were significantly lacking. And so that performative allyship, yeah, it, it shows that at times you're like with the cause, but when it really pertains to me and my advancement as a black woman holistically, that was where it was always fell short. Um, but I would say like the positive aspects of mentoring have been during um, graduate school and then with Natasha's team as well. I think one of the biggest things is this culture piece. So in both spaces, culture and our, ident our identities were often incorporated as like the starting pieces. So who are we, what backgrounds do we hold and how do they influence our research or our, just our interests? And so if that wasn't a part of it, I would not have felt included in this environment. And so just using culture, identities, um, and being open to correction has really helped to um, help for this to be a positive like mentoring experience, especially in research as well. So those are my positive and negative. I guess for me, positives is every research group that I've personally gone into, 
race was never a thing that was an avoided topic. So we would always talk about it ahead of the, like ahead of the curve to say like, hey, we all come from different backgrounds of life. We all have different styles of, you know, um, getting work done or uh, receiving information in different ways. And so I remember one mentor specifically um, asked me and another coworker, hey, what is the best way that you guys receive, you know, let's say criticisms. And so I know for me, because kind of coming from like my undergrad institution and I'm um, not saying my research mentor at that time did this, but I was so used to, let's say people critiquing me and, you know, let's say a mean way, or, you know, um, just kind of like putting me down. I was like, Hey, I'm cool with any critiques. Like, you know, however you want to do it, that's fine. I'm, I'm receiving this as information. I'm not going to get upset about your tone of voice. I'm going to look at more as to what you're trying to say to improve. Um, but in that moment, he told me, he was like, Hey, Lisa, while, you might have experienced that. That's not something I'm going to do because I feel like I don't want to put you down as a person. I want to make sure that I'm supporting you and uplifting you. So through that conversation, I was able to, you know, become aware of, you know, not only are there different mentoring styles, but let's say the mentoring style that I might be most accustomed to may not be the best fit for how I'm going to develop as like a junior researcher or a junior scientist. And so um, with that uh, uh, at hand, especially on the race topic, um, especially when the um, Black Lives Matter uh, happened, I think it was like a, a year or so ago with the protests and stuff. I know my mentor, um, they reached out to me. They were checking in on me saying, hey, if you can't come into work today because you're, you know, feeling, you're not feeling so well and there's a lot of heavy stuff going on, um, I'm here if you want to talk about it. Uh, I can I can make sure I can create a safe space for you to uh, make sure that you feel okay. And so um, race was never something that was uh, like an issue with any any of my group because it was something that was always on the table. Um, I would say a negative though is a lot of the researchers that I've worked with tend to be not micromanagers in terms of hey I'm going to allow you to kind of jump in and you know decide what is the best or how are you best gonna get this research done that needs to be done? Um, however, with that, some researchers, I guess, did not realize that being a junior scientist, there's so much that I don't know. And sometimes holding my hand along the way is very helpful. So for example, what um, Natasha illustrated in terms of, hey, uh, you know, Alyssa, I need you to write this uh, results report on this section and I need it done in two weeks. Is that something that you can do reasonably? And I could say, you know, yes, I can, but I don't know how to write a results paper. So like, you know, can we take the 10 seconds or 10 minutes or ever how long it takes um, to kind of, you know, do a practice to kind of say, okay, this is what you do. And so rather than we, rather than putting the onus on me to have to figure out how, what do I need to do to write stuff out? Um, I think that was a negative that I didn't like in the past where I was given too much uh, research freedom to kind of figure out something that I didn't know. Um. And I'll start with the negative. Um, one thing is being delegated tasks that are relatively simple or easy to do and not being challenged um, was really negative for me because I wasn't able to grow my skills and my mindset um, or be able to think critically because I was only given uh, a few things that they thought that I can fulfill. And so, on the other spectrum, Dr. Kirks does the opposite. <laughs> um, definitely gives me new tasks in terms of writing, which is such a fear for me because um, I've definitely avoided it in the past, but she's been very um, critical in walking me through it each step and like being sure to not only give criticism, but also uplift and build that confidence because I would say that I am one of the the members on the team that is working through a lot of imposter syndrome and so I'm fighting a lot of what has been told to me from previous um, research teams currently. Um, another negative experience I will highlight from having a white mentor is being always asked what can I do but not doing the like her not doing the work. And so her looking to me to provide the answers for her um, was something that was very heavy for me because at times like I didn't know either, but I knew like something else needs to be done. And I would prefer at the time, I would prefer her to educate herself or do a little bit of work on her own. Um, and that goes back to performative allyship is not only being present when there is a time of distress or uprising, 
um, don't only change your profile pictures to black during that time. And then the next week, I don't hear anything from you. So like just being consistent and really trying to do the work on your own, um, as well as asking how can you support um, in a way that's not putting the pressure on your students to give you answers. Um, and then my last thing in terms of positivity is really being flexible. That is very important for me. <laughs> I am definitely one. I have a lot of things going on personally um, with my family, also like other work tasks. And so I'm definitely the one that's like, okay, maybe I can't get it done this week. And so being able to communicate with Dr. Crooks and let her know like, can we push this back is very important for me. Thank you all for sharing. What do you feel like if you've had great experiences or positive experiences with white mentors, what are some of the best ways that they've been offered to support you or engage you in research? So for me, the current mentor that I have now, um, which I'll probably be taking, um, or it's going to be my mentor for my PhD, I think one of the best things she's ever done is because I'm so used to having to find mentors by myself, sometimes I feel like the onus falls upon me to have to find somebody. So when I described to her exactly what I wanted to do, it sounded a little convoluted and it didn't necessarily fall into her field. Rather than just saying, hey, you know, these are some people you could talk to or, you know, I'm not the best person for you, go free. You know, you, you no longer are responsibility to me. She literally connected me to Natasha and she told me, hey, I can't help you right now, let's say in the, you know, the current research that you want to do, or let's say with the experience level that you have. So I'm going to carry you over to this other person who's going to support you. However, while working with Natasha, please report back to me to say, how is the experience? Are they helping you? You know, is this what you were looking for? If not, I can try to connect you with another person. So I think it's like the, the fact that she took my hand and she said, I'm not going to abandon you just because I can't specifically help you with what you're asking me to help you with right now, but I'm going to connect you without you yourself having to put in, you know, let's say the extra work to figure out how am I going to introduce myself to Dr. Crooks? You know, she could be a Nobel Peace Prize winner. And why would she want to talk to me as like a lowly student? Um, she, she gave me the support that I needed to understand that you're not going to abandon me on my journey of research, but you're also not going to you know, take me and say that no one else can be your mentor because not only can she be my mentor, other people can be my mentor and give me valuable, valuable experience as well. So, um, but she's the only uh, white mentor that I've had so far. For my white mentor, I would say what helped was her just learning who I am. So on a personal and professional level, so she just got to know about my family, about, you know, my aspirations, what I'm doing in school, and always checking up on me. And that's where that consistency came in place. Like, even when it wasn't just about Black Lives Matter instances and things in the, in the media, she was just always checking up on me and she still maintains that. Um, and then also, like, what Alyssa was saying is that she's a mentor in a specific area which means that she doesn't have some of the resources that I need in a sense to advance me in other areas. And so a lot of what she did was like connecting me to different people, um, you know, reviewing things for me or just seeing how she can be supportive and then checking back on how that support or those resources panned out. And so I think it's one thing like what Alyssa was saying, like, yeah, I don't have what you need right now, but I'm gonna give you some directives and then let's check up to see how those panned out for you or what else can we do. So I think just establishing relationship, being con um, being consistent, and then also sharing resources has been super, super helpful with this mentor. I definitely agree. Um, I think one of my other mentors has definitely used her privilege and connections to um, offer opportunities and create those for me during undergrad. She um, was a very affluent uh, faculty member tenure. And so she did have a lot of pool and was able to create those opportunities for me and create those connections. And so I believe um, that was very valuable to advance my own, not only research career, but like my potential in being a med student 
Also, she was an advocate by writing letters, um, recommendation letters. Um, she also did review applications and things of that sort. Um, so definitely using that sense of privilege that she had to give me a different realm than I was used to, um, given that I am like first gen, so. And then also adding on that with what Warren Diamond said, um, also to um, the whole ideology of getting to know a person outside of research, because yes, me coming up to the lab, I am interested in research, but who I am as an entity isn't research. So once I step out of that lab, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's going on with me. And so as a result, if you don't know who I am and what I'm going through, let's say if it takes me two weeks to get you something that should technically take me three days, rather than you sitting there wondering, you know, why is it taking you so long? You're aware that, you know, hey, I might have family traumas going on, or I might have my own personal trauma going on. And so as a result, um, I think also, um, uh, like a, a mentor who provides resources to help out. So I know with my mentor, she's been um, doing a, a fantastic job in terms of providing resources, um, let's say in terms of mental health and providing things that I may or may not be aware of. So even though it's not directly related to the research that's going on, she's showing me support in all facets of my life. I'm going to add to that too. One, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's super, super important. Um, I'll let you go, Diamond. But one of the things that what she did also was this transparency piece. And so she also talked with me and we talked extensively about how she contributes to systemic and structural racism in academia, in other places, and how she's doing the work. But then also how can she learn from me and how can I learn from her as well? And so a lot of it was, a lot of it is still about how, what does power look like in these higher academia spaces? And what is my role and how am I observed by white people as a black woman in these spaces? And so like having those transparent conversations about race and structural racism with her and her role in it was super, super helpful. And I was just you know, establishing a relationship that was authentic to just my journey as a Black woman as well. Um, so that was what Alyssa reminded me of too. Yeah, um, another thing is like being patient. So I, for me personally, it takes me a while to open up or be transparent about personal situations, especially in a setting where I don't feel is necessarily a safe space or I identify it to be a professional space. Um, and so it may take time for you to be able to create that connection with your student, but please continue to try to do so. Um, please continue to ask them, how are they doing, go deeper and really try to understand them as a person because they are very layered and come with a lot. Um, but they may not necessarily open up to you the first time you ask. And so that is something that I want you to carry with you as well. And what my mentors have done previously, because it does take me time, <laughs> Natasha even, so um, as well. And I definitely feel comfortable with her, but it took some time as well, just like my personal um, personality. So you may have students like me who take a, it's a hard nut to crack. <laughs> And, and what that what that really looks like, because no, Diamond is like highlighting a very important piece is that like Natasha does a fantastic job of this is where like I feel like any space I enter, like if, if there's like an if they're even if they're a year older than me, sometimes I feel like it's the whole like, you know, ma'am or madam sir situation where it's like we might be in the same age range, but at the same time, I still see you as like a, a higher up. So there's that power differential. But what, how Natasha essentially, I guess, made me feel like this was a safe space or a comfortable space where I could just kind of open up and be myself is she shares parts of her life, you know, that she, she shows that vulnerability. She is vulnerable. And so with that, I've been able to, you know, shift from her being this you know, amazing doctorate person who has all these like uh, publications and stuff to this, you know, just this real human woman, you know, she has life experiences, she goes through everything. And, you know, just like me, she makes mistakes, just like me, she makes decisions and she makes choices. And, you know, she lives a very real life. So kind of like being vulnerable on your side will allow the students to also become vulnerable after. I'll ask one last question and we can open it up to everybody. 
What would you say have been your biggest rewards of working in research? I would say being my identity, I would say that it has better informed how we approach certain populations, especially like in research, how we like um, develop like curiosity about how certain groups perform in this. So like with our research with, with black girls, I think it helped with our identities to be able to know like this is how have some awareness about this cultural group or this population. But what has been rewarding is that we get to, in a sense, add a corrective voice to the data. And so we have knowledge and information or just experiences about this group that best better informs how we're interpreting the data or how we're looking at it or how we're examining it. Because a lot of the literature that exists around Black people is very pathological in nature. It's very dehumanizing. And so I think we've been able to give more a corrective and well-rounded understanding of this population that is very multifaceted. And so that has been the most rewarding part so far is just giving a corrective understanding and interpretation of their experiences. For me, it'll have to be the community engagement piece. I definitely am so fulfilled with connecting with members of my community and not only educating them in a way that's not full of jargon, but really letting them know what's accessible for them or what they can use to decrease their sexual risk because a lot of them don't know. And yes, it is important to produce the publications, but realistically, they are not reading those. Um, so how do we get the information to them directly? And so being able to go out into the community and talk to them and give these workshops I've been able to do so. And for me, I love that because I, you can write about Black people all day, but it's important to also have that on the ground connection and do the work um, immediate, like that immediate connection. And so I love that. And then finally, for me, I think it's the versatility and the adaptability. So um, understanding that um, because I want to go into global health, I'm going to be engaging with all different kinds of populations. And so research is something where you have to kind of figure out what is it within the population that's being affected or what's the, what's the issue and how is the best way to solve it. So I think through research, it's allowed me to have that open-minded thinking to, let's say, for example, I know for me in my own personal experience, I've been having a lot of um, financial difficulties in relation to mental health. But then let's say talking to my peers, talking to other people, um, not only let's say black women, but uh, people of other races have have also had issues, especially within our age range. And so with that, it kind of challenges me to kind of think, okay, you know, could I set up a research group or, you know, some kind of supportive group that allows me to um, find a way to bypass this financial difficulty to allow greater access to young adults who, you know, recently time out of their parents' insurance and haven't figured out what insurance is to begin with um, to be able to access mental health care. And although it's not related to, you know, STIs, STDs, you know, Black health, but it's still allowing me to help a population based off the needs that they have. So, you know, with the training that I'll get with my PhD, even if I say I get a PhD in a background with child maternal health or, you know, epidemiology, it doesn't matter because when I step out, if I decide I want to go into public policy or, you know, back into basic science research, I understand it's not necessarily my my credentials that make me a good researcher. It's my ability to be adaptable in any situation and kind of figure out based off the population I'm working with, what's going to what's gonna benefit them the best way and how. Y'all are amazing. I'm going to open it up to questions. I see Phoenix has a question. Go ahead. First and foremost, amazing. What a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And the panelists, all of you, uh, just really have done a fabulous job. Uh, I really look forward to what uh, your what work will come from you in the future around your, um, your advocacy, your research, as well as the good mentorship um, that you've all have been exposed to and are learning about best practices. 
Um, what I'd like to do is to make sure that you um, can put the work that you're doing in context. And what do I mean by that? Natasha will have the ability to obtain research for NIH level research to do conduct qualitative research on black girls and their sexuality. From that, you will have that training and experience to do the work that you want to do. But the work that it, uh, shoulders that Natasha is standing on is with us in the room. Uh, Dr. Connie Dallas is a retired uh, faculty from the College of Nursing. She, to my knowledge, is the first Black woman and perhaps person to get in a R01 level NIH funding to do qualitative research on Black men as, as fathers. So the work that she has done has laid the groundwork for all the work that Natasha will be able to do in funded work with and respected work when qualitative research in Black population that is laying the foundation for the work that, that you are doing as well. So I'd like just to take this moment to uh, have Dr. Dallas uh, just say hello, introduce herself, and, and to share some of her wisdom with you as well. Well, those are really kind words. Thank you so much. I uh, am deeply impressed by what I heard of the group. I came in a little late, but what an incredibly intelligent, articulate, and, and progressive group you have going there. That's, that's really, that does my heart good. It warms my heart to know that such very good people are coming into nursing. And Dr. Cooks, um, you sound astonishing. I, I wish you were there when I was there. I wish I'd had an opportunity to work with you. So thank you so much. Thank you for those very kind words. And I also believe that there is a Dr. Julian on the call as well, who's a faculty at Rush University. Um, Dr. Julian, you have a few words you'd like to say to the panelists? She's still right there. Ah, she may have dropped off. Still there. Maybe she dropped off. Unless she maybe has dropped off. Well, I just wanted to make sure that introduction was made. Um, it was what the, some of the things that I've learned from uh, Connie during our time when we overlapped about the importance of black men in research as and critical parts of family is where I um, was able to have the language and the knowledge space to advocate for on behalf of Natasha in a critical meeting in uh, with one of her ment mentor, larger mentor groups that was associated with her funding. So things don't happen by accidents. Things happen by legacy, by connection, and by being willing to stand up, work together, and advocate on behalf of. So thank you, Dr. Dallas. Thank you, Natasha, and thank you to your panelists who will indeed, who are indeed Generation Next. Thank you. That was so beautiful. Thank you so much. <laughs> Warming my heart. Um, does anyone else have any questions? We've created a welcoming space, I, I believe. So don't be afraid, don't hesitate to ask them questions. Well, I'll have a, I have a question. What, what will you be your priorities as mentors? I'd like to ask the panel of mentees. I would say for me, um, as a mentor, I think it's super, super important to Take a like, um, so like kind of what we talked about already, like all the factors that we've talked about, like culture, being flexible, um, being transparent. But I think one of the biggest things is being in a position to teach and also to learn. Um, I feel like in this space, we, I've been able to learn from Dr. Cooks, but then I think I've also been able to tell her things about maybe if it's the side of psychology or whatever it may be. So like we've we're able to hold our expertise together. And so I think that that is one of the biggest things that I hope to take into mentoring. And then also um, what I love that Dr. Cooks does is that she teaches us about the underside of research 
And so like she really goes through us with the process of like reviewing um, when we get back from like for edits and stuff like that or about grants. And so it really helps us to be, to actually advance in the field and not just to be stagnant, not just to be research assistants, but how can I see myself progress and that's why I love that she takes. And that's what I truly, truly hope that I can take that, take that teaching piece into my mentoring relationships as well. I think for me, the two biggest things is just being a human mentor and letting them know that, you know, although let's say I'm in a position of power, this is not, you know, you're, I'm the master, you're the subordinate. It's more so of we are like equal on this team and my role here is to help it uplift you and support you and um, let you know that you are capable of, you know, producing good quality research. Um, but then also with that too, I think the um, other biggest thing I'm gonna, uh, I would wanna do as a mentor is just, I don't say dismantling, but breaking down the whole process to understand that while research is a beast within itself, it's something that can be understood at, any level, you know, it's just literally the approach and how you deliver it. So letting, um, what Natasha does great in terms of like the whole paper thing. I remember I was working with um, one mentor and they were like, hey, I want you to write a grant. And I was like, do I have like any resources or anything? And they're like, yeah, just Google it. And I'm like, okay. So there I was sitting, writing my little 15 page paper. I don't know what the heck is going on, sent it to them. And I was like, how was it? And they're like, this is bad. And I was like, well, yeah, I guess I, I don't have any, I don't have any support. So I absolutely love how, especially with the writing process, Natasha, she'll bring up examples, she'll break things down and she'll literally be like, okay, this is exactly what I mean in terms of, you know, let's say we'll take a quote and this is how to um, write a result section, or this is what to do where you wanna just free write, you wanna kind of like look at different strategies and she'll give examples of what I need to do so that it's clear cut for me as to what my responsibilities and roles are, but also understanding that it's it it takes baby steps. It's it's not we're not going to jump to the whole staircase to the top of the flight. You know, it, it's going to take step by step before we get to the top. So just kind of breaking things down and making things more um, manageable um, to kind of understand is is probably one of the other biggest thing I focus focus on. <sighs> Um, thank you to my colleagues, but <laughs> this is a very loaded question and I'm still thinking about the answer, but I think staying true to myself, I would possibly, my first two priorities would be making sure that I am catering to the whole person of my mentees, really getting at um, the trauma that they bring with them, their personal experiences and their lived experiences and how it's affecting the work that they do. Um, I know for me, sometimes it can be paralyzing and cause me not to produce or work as efficiently as possible. And so I think in order to work around that, I really have to engage my, my mentees as a person um, and offer them any mental health resources or anything else that I can give them. Um, my second priority will be making sure that I conduct community-centered research. Um, just creating that connection and making sure that my mentees also have that, that ability to be personable with the people that they're writing about, with the people that they are um, disseminating this information to. And so making sure that they are able to um, check their privilege and their power as well as researchers. And I think that's very important for myself and my mentees. And so, um, those are the two takeaways that I'll start with for sure. Go ahead, Randy. Um, so I was just, I was gonna ask um, what you think uh, the panelists, which by the way, everybody, Thank you for your time and your effort and your energy. It's it's so engaging and I'm just really enjoying myself and learning a ton. Um, wondering from you all what you think that the best way for white faculty uh, to address privilege and whiteness uh, within a research team. Head on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if anything you can take from today is really address it 
first and foremost, um, do not welcome eggshells around it. It makes us more uncomfortable um, when you're uncomfortable. And so it <laughs> really just um, noting that and also take it another level and what do you do to address that? So how do you go about your daily life and as a researcher and as a mentor to combat that? And what are you doing to empower more diverse mentees? What are you doing to give them more opportunities? How are you learning them as a person and acknowledging their culture? Um, so bring it up. Yeah, and I think that's especially um, true in research groups that don't, uh, their research doesn't re uh, um, revolve around race. So like, let's say for example, in the basic science research that um, I was doing nothing that we did necessarily involved race, but as Diamond said, um, literally bringing that up initially and just kind of talking about, yes, we have all different kinds of people on this team um, who can do different things, but also just uh, checking in on um, uh, each, each student to kind of make sure, you know, hey, are you okay? Um, being continue, uh, being consistent with the support that you provide, um, but then also at the same time, like not necessarily not necessarily coming from a place of, you know, if someone shares a trauma that is specific to them and specific to their race, saying something to the effect of, oh, I understand or I can relate because um, in actuality, you can't. Um, I think also being careful with your word choice by saying, you know, hey, that is something that is very traumatic. And that's something um, that is, you know, I, I can I can see how that is a bad situation, but um, showing support without making yourself the center of it, but also bringing the conversation back to you, I think is super important as well. Um, so making sure that if someone talks about it, um, allowing it to relate to them and then giving them support versus just taking it away, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I would share similarly with what Diamond and Alyssa said. Uh, I think the more so is just making sure that, like what we talked about a welcoming space. So not invalidating experiences like, oh, I can relate, like what Alyssa was sharing, but just making sure that we're holding space for their identities and for their identities to sit and not to be, you know, brushed away because, oh, I'm this white person coming in trying to connect. I feel like that trying to connect is where the relationship disrupts. And so just allowing that person to hold space of whatever they're experiencing, if racism does come out, in the research setting, just allowing for a conversation to be had and addressing it head on and not avoiding it um, or reducing their experience as well. I also think it's really important to bring in what's happening in the larger context and using conversation and controversies in the fields to be able to um, spur on and provide a context for um, discussions in the lab. So for example, you're, as you're saying, there may be things where in which research, uh, race has nothing to do with the research activities of, of the lab, but there have been scholars who've been talking about disparity torus, right? Where there are non, um, there are researchers or, uh, from majority groups who have jumped on, if you will, the health equity research bandwagon and their research and their science and, their, and they have been prioritized in terms of uh, access to funding and how does privilege play off in you know play a role in who is evaluating grants who's most eligible who's receiving them who's being excluded from them and whose voices are who have been in the trenches doing the work for the longest periods of time become silenced in the processes um, so there are ways in which it is um, appropriate to bring it up using, again, controversies, issues that are happening in the field as a way to discuss, educate, and um, you know, think about ways in which your lab can, can go about doing their work differently. And then with that as well, um, I know sometimes with these conversations, it, it can get a little bit nuanced where um, I know, for example, in med school, when uh, the Black Lives Matter, um, like the, the protest happened, everybody, including faculty, everybody wanted to talk about it, but it wasn't the right space to kind of talk about it because it was like, okay, 
are, I'm, I'm trying to understand, are, do you want me to talk about it because you're more concerned about me or are you trying to, you know, uh, just get some trauma porn, you know, where it's just sort of like, oh, you just want to get, let's say a feel good story, or you want to um, hear something to, you know, say that, hey, I know someone who went some, through something that was really bad and I felt bad for them. And so as a result, you know, look at me being an ally. That's not necessarily the case. So depending on the demographics of your research group, um, I think it's definitely important to bring up context, um, but also just being aware of the space where some conversations might be better had um, with that individual student or maybe with a couple of students on the side to kind of gauge what is your level of comfortability in terms of talking about this in a bigger group because maybe they may not feel super vulnerable because someone in the group they feel like don't contri doesn't contribute to making it a safe space and so as a result revealing a part of themselves might be might hinder them versus helping them in the long run too. So just kind of, I guess, being careful to kind of tease that out and understand that there's a lot of nuance when it comes to those kinds of conversations. And it also goes back to, to knowing your team, right? Knowing them as individuals, that whole person and whether or not they're silent learners, right? Or sharers, um, or they're the hard nut right, that you have to crack. So maybe it's not a good space to do it within that research team, but on an individual level, be an email or a text message, right? Um, as the as the like basic level of kind of acknowledgement. I think that's an easy way to kind of get the conversation started, um, but also not putting the burden onto students to come talk to you if they have an issue or they're struggling or um, that's one of the biggest takeaways I get from the team is the check-in is critical. Checking in on people, especially people of color during this time, during this context is huge. Again, starting off with the, how are you? But how are you really doing? I can see in your face, <laughs> you're struggling. Are you, you know, are you, are you getting sleep? How are you like going and digging deeper into those mental health pieces again are, are critical to this whole person um, identity. But does anyone else, else have any questions? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, Laura. I was gonna say one thing to that. Like if there is like a group setting and there are like uh, existential factors that are, you know, impacting minority groups, maybe sometimes like a, a group check-in of how are you, is it, isn't sufficient and maybe like they need individualized check-in and so like emails or a phone call or text message because maybe the group setting sometimes is too much to be able to really express how I'm truly feeling at this moment so there's our opportunity to get more individualized as well and then really quickly with that also understanding that it's not an overnight process so with the white mentor that I personally have even though she was, you know, super supportive, always letting me know that, you know, she was a safe space and she was someone I could talk to. It took me about a year <laughs> before, you know, I felt comfortable to open up with her. So I think it's that consistency piece and understanding that, you know, in a month, two months, six months, a year, maybe a year and a half, some students may take a little bit more time to warm up for you to, for whatever reason, but just, just keep at it. Keep, if you are authentic, they will be authentic with you. Um, may not be on your same timeline, but it, it'll happen. And I just had one thing I wanted to go back on in terms of like checking in and having these conversations with your team. Something to acknowledge is that most of your mentees have been coaxed to bottle up or present some of these issues in a way that's more palatable for you. Um, so we are learned to tailor the words and make it more accepting so that we don't offend you. Um, and that's something that you will also have to navigate of how not to perpetuate that and make them feel like they have to make what their experiences are more accepting for you and not offensive versus um, really take the content and try to understand that um, and what they're giving you and also take accountability to how you are either addressing that, what you've done in the past and how you plan to move forward. Thank you for that, ladies. Thank you, everyone who attended. Thank you so much to this, to our speakers, to this panel. You all have been amazing and given some really, um, really incredibly helpful and important insights. Um, 
anyone who hasn't, please make sure that you put your email and name in the, um, I guess you can just put your email because we can see your name um, if your name is on your Zoom. Um, but put, place it in the chat, please. Um, we will send a follow-up email just with a reminder to complete the survey. And if you scroll up to the top of the chat, I've put a link to the Survey Monkey um, site where you can fill out the survey and, um, and obtain your continuing nursing education um, certificate for 1.75 CNE. Um, this recording will also be posted on our UIC YouTube channel. Um, so we'll send an email out about that um, for six months so that people can obtain um, continuing ed that way. Um, thank you all so much. Does anyone have any questions or final thoughts? I will just say thank you to my research team again. It takes a lot of courage to be vulnerable, especially in a space like this, um, and transparent and honest. And I think you all did that. And I'm very proud of you. So congrats. Pat yourself on the back. Do something uh, to celebrate today. Thank, Thank you all you. so much for being willing to share Thank with you. us. Sorry, go ahead, Diamond. Oh, um, Dr. Crooks did have a reflection for you all um, at the end of the PowerPoint. <laughs> Something to leave you all with, but thank you for this time and space. Thank you. The question that I was gonna leave you all with is what would you do differently in your mentoring practice? Um, if time or money were not an issue, what exact, what would you do differently? I think it's a good point of reflection for all of us, right? Um, so yeah, I'll leave you with, leave you with that. And the other question was, if you were to describe in one word, your mentor, their mentor, you would like to be, what would you choose and why? So Phoenix kind of already spoke to that, but really one word, one characteristic, I think that embodies mentorship, um, sit with that and, and reflect on that. But again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone.